Grace and peace to each of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, on a Sunday such as this, I don't know that a wedding story or a celebration story is what I would have chosen if it was up to me. Seems awfully contrary to the days and the circumstances that we're living in to be envisioning ourselves in the midst of a large celebratory gathering with a a feast and a spread out before us and wine and dancing and music. We can dream of that day. We can dream of those celebrations and hope for those days to come. But it isn't our reality today. That we are still in the midst of a pandemic, worshiping online in the midst of the grief and sorrow that has come with this moment. We are in the midst of a time in our congregational life that's filled with goodbyes, of preparing for some of the grief that happens in the midst of pastoral transitions. Even just this morning, as we receive news about Al Schlager's death, our hearts are filled with grief and sorrow. Many of us don't feel like going to a wedding or going to a party this day. We feel like we need to gather to mourn, gather to console, gather to look for hope in the midst of these moments. But I think we still can, if we're intentional about it, glean some value and a hopeful, life-giving message from this story this morning. And what I want us to do as we're invited into the gospel passage is to think about the story behind the story. Because the story on the surface is a story of a wedding and a story of a miracle that Jesus performs, the one that is commonly known as the first miracle of his ministry, although it is just the first miracle in John's gospel. And I want to look behind that story today, to the story behind the story that's on the surface. And the way for us as a community to get to the story behind the story is to look at the character of Mary. Because Mary is the first person named in this story at the very beginning of the gospel account. And it says in the midst of a wedding celebration It is Mary that notices that the wine has run out and notice that this is likely a problem for the stewards and the hosts of this wedding celebration. And so she comes to Jesus and makes uh, Jesus aware of the situation. And Jesus asks the question, what concern of this is to you? Now, some of us would just dismiss Mary at that point and say, well, Jesus has bigger things on his mind, or this story is meant to glorify Jesus in his name and the miracle that he performs. But in doing so, we miss the story behind the story because clearly Mary is concerned about something. Notice this, Mary is concerned or else she wouldn't have come to Jesus in the first place. Because most of the guests at that wedding, I would guess, like probably many people in our world and even in our own communities, if the wedding ran out of wine and the party was starting to die down, you wouldn't say anything about it. You would just go and get your coat and sort of say, well, I guess it's time to go, right? Is that we would just sort of duck out the back door and say, well, that's it. Well, the other thing to know in this story is that people generally wouldn't have just ducked out the back door if the wine ran out prematurely. That in the culture and society of Jesus's time, which was an honor and shame society, if the host of a wedding banquet or any type of celebratory party like this failed to live up to their expectations of the party that was being thrown, the guests would not just leave out the back door, they would heap shame on the hosts of that party on their way out. They would likely complain about it and they would say, oh, woe to this family, likely the bride's family. Woe to them for not having been prepared. Woe to them for leaving and hanging everyone out to dry in the midst of what should be a celebration. Shame, shame upon you, shame upon the bride, shame upon this wedding. 
and hold that shame with you as you go forth. That's how an honor and shame society works. If you don't live up to the expectations of the culture and the society, you are going to be shamed and you are going to have to deal with the cost of that shame going forward. And so what is Mary concerned with when she comes to Jesus at this point in the wedding celebration? I believe it's because Mary has empathy upon this family. Mary is concerned about the shame that potentially could come upon the hosts of this banquet and perhaps even that bride that she knows all too well what it would have felt like to have shame heaped upon her. Mary is likely deeply concerned about the impact of what happens if that wine runs out, not just because she wants to keep drinking and keep the party going, but that she has deep empathy and compassion for the hosts of that party. And so Mary comes to Jesus, not knowing probably what to do herself, but trusting that what she has seen in her son has the capacity to work a miracle to change things in this circumstance, to turn things around where things feel hopeless or that there's just not enough or that shame is on its way. Mary turns to Jesus and says, you can do something about this. And as Jesus initially dismisses her, Mary pays him no attention. Do you notice that? In Jesus' dismissal of Mary of saying, woman, what concern of this is to you? My time has not yet come. I don't want to be on the stage yet. Mary doesn't even rebuke Jesus. Mary just keeps on going. She goes right to those stewards and says, do what Jesus is going to tell you. Because she has so much trust and faith in the midst of this terrible situation to come that Jesus can do something about it. And so it's from there that Jesus, even though it's not in the gospel text, likely knows that there's no way he can say no to his mother when she's already set this ball in motion. It's like most of us can't say no to a mother once they have gotten their request into our hearts. And so sure enough, Jesus has them bring forth water in these uh, ritual purity jugs and it's there that this miracle takes place, where that water, an ordinary substance, something that was found in abundance but wouldn't have been of much value in a wedding celebration, gets transformed into flowing jugs of wine. And not just the bad wine, not just something that will do, but the abundantly rich and valuable good wine that even the steward can recognize is going to bring honor upon them and the household. Jesus does not just turn water into wine. Jesus turns shame into honor. Jesus turns the cultural expectations of a moment like this on its head and allows the stewards and the hosts of that party to then be glorified in the midst of this moment, to be able to turn a mindset of scarcity and shame into abundance and honor and life and joy and celebration. So you see the story behind the story offers us an awful lot to chew on and an awful lot of good news for us today. Because like Mary, like the stewards and the hosts of this wedding banquet, there are plenty of people in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our families, even those of us gathered today that knows what it feels like to not have enough, to feel like our time or our money or our emotions or our presence or our physical abilities whatever it may be, are too scarce. And in the midst of that scarcity, of feeling like we are not enough or don't have enough, what happens? We then take on shame and guilt for ourselves. How often have I heard 
from folks in our congregation, our communities. I wish I just had some more money to give to make a difference. Or I wish that my physical capacity was greater, that I could just do a little bit more like I wish I could. Or I just wish that I could show up, but I'm so bone tired and exhausted that I just can't do it anymore. And what do we do? We don't just acknowledge that we're short of something. We then feel guilty about it. Or we feel shameful that we in our bones are not enough for those people that we care about or the communities that we care about or the causes that we care about. We think we should be able to do more. And when we can't, it burdens us. And we withdraw and isolate. We feel ashamed. So in the midst of this story today, in the midst of this miracle, perhaps the good news for us is that it is okay to name when we don't feel like we have enough or that we are enough. It is okay to acknowledge the shame and the guilt that we carry with us. It is okay to be honest about the reality of the situation we face. And in the midst of doing so, in the midst of that vulnerability to ourselves, to God, and to others, we may find that Jesus is there with us as well, helping us process those things and perhaps waiting to work a miracle in our midst. Now, let me caution you all from a place of personal experience that oftentimes we want to take the miracle into our own hands. Instead of turning to Jesus, we turn to our own willpower and strength and say, you know what, I think I can make up for that. In the midst of my deep shame and guilt, I'm going to keep taking on more and I'm going to do more and I'm going to save this situation myself. For any of you that saw the Holy Moly video before worship, Perhaps you saw those stewards frantically trying to find grapes and find whatever resources they can and trying to stomp them into wine and get them out there. And sure enough, what happens? That's terrible drink. It's not good. I can tell you as your pastor, one of my biggest sins in your midst over these last five years is I have clearly at times tried to do too much on my own. I have been the one that has put everything on my back and said, you know what, let me try to work the miracle here. Instead of turning to Jesus and saying, what are you up to in the midst of this community? What other resources exist that I could ask or seek to include? What hidden blessings and opportunities are out there that if I got out of my own way could have been possible? It's there that Mary is the example for us today. She doesn't strive to do it all on her own or fix every last little situation. Mary turns to Jesus, to the body of her son, and trusts that he will be able to make it possible. For all of us today as a congregation and as people, striving towards compassion for one another, striving to make our church the best community it can be. Today, we don't have to bear the weight of a miracle on our shoulders. That we can turn to one another as the body of Christ. We can turn to the Holy Spirit in our midst. We can turn to our sisters and brothers in our communities and other congregations and say, you know what? We may be a little bit afraid today that we may not have enough or that we're too tired, or that the guilt and shame of this moment may be too much to bear. But sisters and brothers, we are surrounded by the body of Christ. We are surrounded by the presence of Jesus in our midst, that when we come together and we bring our concerns and our fears about scarcity to God, and when we do it as one broad community, We can trust that God will provide. It may not be provisions in what we want, but God will provide what we need. God will provide for us in the moments of our weakness, in the moments of our scarcity. 
when we turn to our sisters and brothers and say, what can we do? And in the midst of that, in the midst of the vulnerability of those moments, in the midst of being honest, we will experience that miracle. Guilt and shame will be transformed into honor and joy for us as well. We will experience new life. So much like the communities around us today, communities that find guilt and shame in their poverty and in their scarcity, but yet they find hope when they turn and rely on one another. Let us allow that to be the miracle that we see in this story today. The miracle that God is providing for us and for our neighbors in and through the body, the community of the church. And let us have some hope that at the end of the day, when this pandemic is done, when the sorrow of our grief and loss subsides, when the transitions and changes have run their course again, there will be moments of dancing. There will be moments of celebration. There will be moments where God is fully known in this life and in the next. That is the promise that we cling to. It is the promise that is our hope. And sisters and brothers, I pray that that promise may be felt deeply by you this day. May God's peace be with each of you. Amen.